I think my real interest, if I traced it back, was curiosity about the physical world, which is what physics is. One might imagine, at least, that one's talking about nature when one's talking about the character of physical laws. But I don't want to talk about nature, but rather how we stand relative to nature now. I want to tell you what we think we know, and what there is to guess, and how one goes about guessing. This is the piece of the equation which describes how the Higgs field acquires its value. This video is being prepared in the frame of the initiative of the American Physical Society. My name is Patrizia Tavella and I will talk about the adventure of physics in timing and positioning. I will start from a letter that Galileo wrote in 1612 to the King of Spain. He had spent a lot of time observing Jupiter satellites and he had uh, precise ideas on, on the configuration of these satellites depending on the moment. And he said that uh, with the table he had prepared, it was impossible not to evaluate the longitude and the position of the ships based on the ephemerides he had computed. In fact, depending on where you are, you have a different perspective on the satellite and from Galileo tables, you can understand where you are. Unfortunately, the King of Spain was very busy in that moment and did not follow the advice of Galileo. But today, the modern navigation system are exactly based on this principle, observing satellite and from the position of the satellite, determining our position. How does it work? Um, the modern navigation system measure a distance, the distance between the satellite and the receiver. And this distance is actually a time measurement, how long the signal coming from the satellite travels to reach you. So let's suppose that you are somewhere with a boat, with a clock, with a special receiver, and you will receive a signal coming from a satellite. You know where the satellite is. The message tells you at what time the signal left the satellite, and you can measure with your clock when the satellite arrived. So you know which is the distance between you and the satellite because this is obtained by the velocity of light multiplied by the travel time you have measured. So it means in two dimension that you are on a circumference whose center is the satellite and whose radius is the distance you have measured. You still do not know where you are, but you repeat the measurement with a second and, if necessary, with a third satellite. And just by geometrical intersection, you can estimate your position. The solution is purely geometrical, very elegant, but attention, errors can be very important. Since we multiply the time of flight by the velocity of flight, it means that an error of three nanoseconds, three billionth of a second, gives you at least one meter error in positioning. And we will see that that three nanoseconds are really nothing. So to have this system working, all the clocks are to be synchronized. They are to be synchronized through a same uh, time scale, which is called reference time scale. First, Question. This reference time scale, should it be synchronized also to the international standard time, which is called UTC? 
strictly for navigation, this is not exactly necessary, but it is necessary if the navigation system is not only tellly, telling you where you are, but also what time it is. So these navigation system are actually answering two questions. Where are you? What time is it? Who is interested in knowing what time is it and could use a navigation system like a GPS, for example, to know what time is it? Yes, ask to the companies distributing electrical power. They need to measure the status of the network with an accuracy of one microsecond in different places to be able to manage co um, co correctly the distribution of energy. And also financial transactions with the high frequency trading need to timestamp what they are doing when you ask to sell or to buy and when they sell or buy with an accuracy of 100 microsecond. Telecommunication is also based on the synchronization of a network and the accuracy is mostly related to frequency accuracy, which is in the level of 10 to the minus 11. So global navigation satellite system have clocks and the core of the measurements is a time measurement. We can see, for example, that there are satellites with clock on board because this is the clock that generates the message and says when the signal starts. There are on ground a special network of control station, monitoring station, which manage all the satellite uh, ensemble and they have uh, usually the reference time scale versus which all the clocks are synchronized. And then, as we said, this reference time may be synchronized to the international time, which is the coordinated universal time computed at the BIPM, the Bureau International de Poids Mesure, where I work, with the support of many laboratories all over the world. So this is the let's say the control chain, the user here has also a clock, which is not a high quality expensive atomic clock. So it's another simple clock. And usually this is not very well synchronized with all the other clocks of the system. So the offset of your receiver becomes the fourth unknown in your problem. You, you will evaluate the free space coordinates and even if you don't know, your receiver evaluates as a fourth unknown the offset of your clock. So we have spoken of clock. Um, time measurement is based on the definition of the second, which is obtained by the cesium atom by appropriately uh, arranging the cesium atom in special structure or other type of atom like hydrogen, for example, and being able to extract the frequency that they can generate when they have a quantum transition between two special levels. There are structures which are called primary frequency standard that are as big as a room in uh, all the components of this device, you can evaluate the contribution of uncertainty for that they are called primary, and they can reach an uncertainty of 10 to the minus 16 in relative value, which means that three nanoseconds error will be accumulated in one year. But there are other type of frequency standard based on optical transition, not on the cesium, which have now demonstrated the capacity to reach 10 to the minus 18 accuracy, which would mean 3 nanosecond in 100 year. For sure, these are not the clock we put on the satellite. The satellite have smaller, lighter, and with low consumption space qualified clock, which can be based on rubidium or hydrogen maser or other type of 
devices. And uh, also, there is a lot of research work on miniaturized atomic clocks, which means making a very small atomic clocks, which could be a wrist watch, but that can also be used in the receiver or on board to improve the performance. This is the current research. And um, this is a satellite. This is one prototype of the European system, Galileo navigation system. And you see that there are many devices inside the satellite. The clocks are just the first uh, part of the chain, but then many other uh, devices are necessary to be able to generate the navigation signal. So we need a good clock on board, but this is not sufficient. We need many other components. And particularly, we have to take care of relativity. With navigation system, relativity is something which is really normal effect because the clock change the time, um, the passing of time, depending on the height at which they are located. And if you put one clock on the mountain and another on the sea at one kilometer of difference in altitude, you could observe three microsecond of difference between the two clocks every year. But if you put a clock on board on a satellite at 20,000 kilometers from the Earth, this effect would be about 40 microseconds in a day. And if you use a satellite clock, which is not corrected by relativity, you can be wrong 10 kilometers each day. So relativity is very important in this type of application where we have the high sophisticated technology at disposal. So let's see what happens um, when you have a satellite, you have the capacity to generate a signal. This signal is a pseudo-random code. Your receiver knows this type of random code and it is able to measure the delay with which the signal arrives at the receiver. This distance is, this, this time of flight is the distance that we were saying before. So let's say, let's write one equation. You can say that if you multiply by the velocity of flight, the difference between the time at which you receive the signal, the time at which the signal left the satellite, this is the distance between the satellite number one and your receiver. You repeat this measurement with three satellites, and in principle, you have solved your problem because the unknown are the three space coordinates of your receiver, the satellite position coordinates, and the time of start of the satellite is given in the navigation message, the time of receiving you measure. So you have all the information to solve for the three unknowns, your free space coordinate with free measurements with free satellite. This is the theory because unfortunately, what you measure is not only a pure distance between the satellite and you. In fact, the signal has to cross the atmosphere. There are many sources of errors. So the equation has to be made a little bit more complex to really represent reality. And um, what we measure is not, unfortunately, a range, but a pseudo range, because we always measure the distance between the satellite and the receiver. But then we have some additional component. For example, the clock of your receiver is not synchronized as an offset with respect to the reference time of the system. Also, the clock on board are telling you maybe it's five o'clock, but the clock is not exactly synchronized with the reference time, and so there is an offset. And then there are other components like the ionosphere, troposphere, other delay, which gives an error on your pseudo range. So we have said clock errors, 
the unknowns to be estimated, as we said at the beginning, are four because there are the free space coordinate and uh, the clock offset. The information from the satellite are the position of the satellite and its clock offset. And then there are other ingredients that you have to measure or to estimate in some way. Let's talk, for example, of the ionosphere. The ionosphere is a sort of layer of electron around the, the Earth. And depending on the light of sight of the satellites, the signal crosses a certain layer of ionosphere. This makes an effect on the signal delaying or and, and this can give tens of meters of errors. Let's see a movie on the ionosphere, which helps in understanding why we have this layer of free electron around the Earth. This comes from the solar activity, which is always uh, emitting particles and um, electromagnetic wave, which reach the Earth. And you see the Earth as a sort of magnetic shield, which allows the Earth to be protected from this solar energy coming down from the sun, but something comes back and makes a special effect around the Earth, which is called the Northern Light, which are beautiful to be seen, but they are terrible on this on the technology technological system like the GNSS satellite signal and also they make an effect on many other devices and particularly on the clock this type of radiation can create some damage which also degrade the clock performance. So we have wrote this equation and we said even if we don't know, the receiver is able to estimate the offset between the receiver clock and the reference time. So if you have a special receiver, you are able to measure the difference between your clock and let's suppose the GPS time, which is the reference time of the Amer GPS system. But there is another information which comes in the navigation message. In the case of GPS, it tells you which is the difference between GPS time and a special realization of the coordinated universal time UTC realized by a special laboratory, USNO. And so you can estimate which is the difference between your clock and the international time as it is predicted and broadcast by the navigation system. So this is why we said that navigation system tells you not only where you are, your space coordinate, but also what time it is. And what time it is is based on uh, the coordinated universal time that we will evaluate and explain now. So for many centuries, time has been kept and unit of time has been defined by observing the rotation of the Earth. But from 1967, the definition of the second changed from the Earth rotation to atomic timekeeping. Let's see what happens. We don't know actually when the use of day and night were used and defined as the measurement standard for time. But for sure, this has always been used. And it was defined that the time, um, the day is the time needed by the Earth to have a complete spin around its axis. And this um, day is divided by 24 hours, 60 minutes, 60 seconds, which makes 86,400 seconds. So the second was defined from the day. A certain Greenwich reference meridian was chosen to be the zero hour. And in 1925, it was decided that this time based on the rotation of the Earth had to be called universal time. Universal time is a good clock. Is the Earth ticking uniformly and constantly in rate? Not really. 
in 1850, it was discovered that the rotational axis of the Earth is moving. And so the rotational axis um, intersect the geoid in a point which is called the pole. And it was observed that the pole was moving. So it means that the rotational axis is moving and as well, the time for an entire spin is not constant. This movement can be observed and there is an international earth rotation and reference system service which provides a lot of information on this type of movement and it can be observed but it's not very easy to be predicted. But this is not the only um, anomalous behavior in the rotation of the earth. It was also discovered uh, uh, before the Second World War that in summer we spin faster. This can be explained not very rigorously, but um, if you think to a dancer, when she has the arm open, she spins with a certain velocity. And when she closes the arm, she spins faster. This is for the conservation of momentum. Something similar happens to the Earth. Imagine in winter, in the northern hemisphere, there are a lot of mountains with snow. So there is a lot of mass which is far from the rotational axis and the Earth has a certain velocity. In spring, when the snow melts, the water goes down to the valley, closes, closes closer to the rotational axis, and so the velocity increases. As I said, this is not very rigorous, but this helps in understanding this type of effect. And there are many other irregularities in the duration of the day. And particularly, we can imagine that there is a loss of energy for friction, for which if you look to the duration of the day centuries ago, it was a little bit shorter than the duration of the day today. There is what is called a secularly slowing down. It means that one day in 1600 was a little bit shorter than one day now because the Earth has slowed down. So it was clear in 1960 that the rotation of the Earth was not the best clock to be used as the definition of timekeeping. So it was considered that if the rotation was maybe not the best, the revolution of the Earth around the Sun was a good candidate to be the standard in timekeeping because that was supposed to be regular. And so the duration of one year was used as a standard and the second was defined as a certain fraction of that year. Particularly important, in this definition, we don't say any year is good as a standard, but that year in 1900, that was the standard duration that was used. And uh, any time we change the definition of a measurement unit, we keep continuity with the previous one. So the ephemeral second has to be as long as the rotational second in the year 1900. And pay attention that it was 1960 and uh, the duration of the ephemeral seconds was kept as long as the universal second in 1900. But 60 years later, the Earth was already a little bit slower and so the duration of the day in 1960 is not the same as in the year 1900. And so the ephemeral seconds was by definition a little bit shorter with respect to the second obtained in 1960 if you take the day as standard. And this is something that still we have today when just Seven years later, in 67, we changed again the definition of the second because the previous one was very complex, too difficult to be measured and accepted. While atomic clocks were ready to operate, they were built 
starting from 1955, and they were able to generate this special signal coming out from the cesium clock with very high precision. So it was defined uh, that a certain number of periods of the radiation corresponding to the cesium atom was the atomic second, and this number of period was measured to give a second, an atomic second, with the same duration of the previous one, the ephemeral seconds, which was in agreement with the universal second in the year 1900. So all of them are in agreement in the year 1900, but it means that nowadays, the atomic second is a little bit shorter than what we would obtain with a day given by the entire rotation of the Earth. So the rotation of the Earth today is a little bit longer than one atomic day obtained as 86,400 atomic second. So with the atomic clock, it was defined that a sort of international average had to be computed called the international atomic time. And this was considered the standard based on atomic clocks. But some users needed to have the civil international timekeeping in agreement with the rotation of the Earth. That was mostly due to the fact that at the epoch there were um, there was a lot of use of navigation methods based on traditional navigation um, tools observing the position of the stars and of the planets. So the angular position of the Earth was important. So it was decided to use a universal coordinated time, UTC, which ticks according to the atomic time but that sometimes add one second in the counting to be in agreement with the rotation of the Earth. Let's see here what happens. When we see that uh, the, uh, the Earth is a little late, almost one second late with respect to the atomic time, which is perfectly ticking, we stop the atomic time for one second we add an additional second and then we start again. This stops for one second the atomic time and allows the Earth to be again in pace with the atomic time. This compromise is called UTC, Coordinated Universal Time, and this practice of adding a second, a leap second, for the moment has been introduced 37 times. So in this moment, TAI is a little bit ahead. UTC comes after, 30 se 37 seconds after, because it is maintained in agreement with the rotation of the Earth, which is given by the universal time, UT1. So today, UTC is a sort of compromise between atomic time and the Earth rotation, and it is computed by the Bureau International des Poids Mesures in Sèvres, close to Paris, where I work. What do we do? We actually have, uh, we take some delay in computing this reference international time because we take all the data make some evaluation and then we publish final results. While each country has national laboratory with clocks which realize in real time a, an approximation of UTC, which is called UTC-K, where K is the name of the laboratory, these clocks and time scale are available in real time. While in our case, we publish results with a delay because we define the international standard and we need to have all the data available completely checked and validated to issue the international standard. This is done nowadays using about 450 atomic clocks which are kept in 80 laboratories all around the world and the clocks are not moved from the laboratory. We use the navigation system to compare them. As you remember, navigation system tells, helps you in estimating the difference between 
your local clock and um, the system time. And so by differencing these measurements, we can estimate the difference between, for example, the Chinese and the Brazilian clock with high accuracy. So we receive uh, every month all these type of measurements from the clock located all over the world. And we make a sort of weighted average that we call a shell atomic libre. Then we have this type of special clock that I showed before, which are frequency standard. They are maybe not always running, but they are very accurate. And they are used to calibrate the average of the other clocks. So sometimes we get this data and we correct the ensemble time to have the same accuracy of this primary standard and we obtain the international atomic time. Then taking into account the measurements of the Earth rotation done by the International Earth Rotation Service um, Institution, we know which are the leap second, we know if a leap second is necessary and we obtain UTC. And actually, our results is to publish the difference between the international UTC and the real-time approximation by the different laboratory in each country. We publish these results in a circular T where you can find for each month on dates spaced by five days, which was the difference between the international UTC and the different realization in the different laboratory in the world. We also publish a weekly rapid solution, which is available on our website. Uh, let me talk a little bit on this leap second. It was introduced in 1972 because at that epoch, it was important to keep the civil time in agreement with the rotation of the Earth mostly because navigation was based on traditional system. Nowadays, navigation is based on global navigation satellite system, no more observing star and planets. And this 61th second is really giving problem to many digital and technological system. So there is a big debate if this leap second should be maintained or not. Unfortunately, we have been discussing now 20 years and still we have not found a good agreement all over the world. And for example, think to the Genesis system, to the GPS system, it would be very cumbersome to synchronize all the clocks of all the system anytime there is one additional second and one second error of the clock on board would be a huge mistake in the positioning. So the GPS time synchronized its time in the 1980 when it was born. It was synchronized with UTC, but then it was not stopped anymore for adding a leap second. So today UTC is no more the GPS time is no more in agreement with UTC because the GPS time is ahead of 18 seconds. And something similar happened for the other navigation system. GLONASS time, the Russian navigation system, decided to add leap second to be in agreement with UTC. Galileo, the European system, decided to use the same number of seconds as GPS for interoperability. Beidou, the Chinese system, was born later. It was synchronized with UTC when it was born, and then and now no leap second were added. So we have easily available in our receiver, in our smartphone, the time from GPS, from GLONASS, from Galileo, from Beidou, and they are all different by seconds with respect to the international standard time UTC. And this is because this system, this space system decided, not all, but mostly decided not to use the leap second. And this is a, a solution that also other applications have taken. And so in this moment, there is a certain 
confusion and too many time scale available. So it was discussed and also um, a few years ago, there was a certain pressure saying that uh, if we abandon li the leap second and we do not keep the civil time UTC in agreement with the rotation of the Earth, there was a certain um, emotional um, worry that the atomic time will go faster, the sun will and the earth will not be in pace. So the atomic time will tell us it's eight in the evening, still the sun, but still the sun is shining. So this is true in principle, but this effect is very small. And we have usually one second each year. We need almost one century to have one minute of difference and we would need 5,000 years to have one hour of difference between the rotation of the Earth and the atomic time. So much less trouble than the fact that navigation, telecommunication and digital system nowadays cannot cope with the leap second. So next meeting it will be in 2023 where we hope all the people will be in agreement and with clear understanding of this problem of the leap second, which is nowadays no more necessary and causing trouble. Let me finish coming back to space again. Clock and timekeepings are no more based on the astronomical observation, but a few years ago, there was a certain excitement because stars were observed to be possibly good as clock. These are the pulsar, which are rotating star, which emits a beam, which is like a lighthouse. Any times there is a rotation of the star, the Earth is spanned by this beam, and it is like a tick, which arrives every period of rotation of this star. These stars are the last, um, last steps in the evolution of uh, the star. They are neutron star, very massive. And um, there are some of them whose rotation is very stable. Every millisecond we see a radio pulse. So the idea to use a as clock was really very exciting. Things are not very easy because uh, the, the, these stars are very far, so there is a lot of noise in the, in the interstellar medium, and uh, the rotation is not constant. The, the rotation period due to friction and loss of energy as well, but many information can be taken from this type of stars, and particularly a Nobel Prize was given to one of our colleagues because he was able by the observation of the pulsar rotation and loss of energy, he, he was able to prove indirectly the existence of gravitational waves. And nowadays with the construction, construction of the square kilometer array, we see that pulsar and pulsar timing are very much uh, under debate, and soon there will be a lot of pulsar observable for many years, and so we think that some information on timekeeping can be obtained. And also there was a study by the European Space Agency, very interesting, thinking when you navigate in space on a space probe and you cannot use the GNSS because you are very far in deep space, what can you use to estimate your position. Well, suppose you can receive the signal from different pulsar. One is spinning very fast and it is in the north direction. The other one has another rotational period and comes from the east. Another one comes from the south with another rotational period. So by knowing these different sources of light pulse, knowing their characteristic period, you can navigate knowing where they are and so estimating where you are in deep space. And so we 
come back again to the idea of Galileo. This star display conjunction, precise configuration, precise value, so that no body of medium intelligence is not able to use them to estimate the position of the spaceship. And with these last words of Galileo, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>